Hi there, welcome to my channel where I take you on tours of tiny and unique homes and showcase stories of people living alternatively. In today's video, we're gonna meet a young couple who decided to downsize and build their own tiny home. But the thing that's really special about this story is that this home is on water. That's right, we're gonna take a tour of a floating tiny home. Sarah and Brandon are gonna explain what it's really like living full-time off-grid on the water through four seasons. And we're gonna also take a tour of their amazing DIY floating home. If you like these kind of videos, make sure that you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you know every single time we publish a new tour. Hi, I'm Brandon. I'm Sarah, and we are so excited to welcome you to our floating home. I'd never heard or seen anything about floating cabins. When I met Brandon and kind of came through this harbor for the first time, I was just immediately absolutely in awe. From growing up living on the water, I thought to myself, this could be something I could get back into. If I want a peaceful way of life again, this may be the perfect boat house combo. So this is Fontana Lake. It's kind of the best of all worlds. We're in a temperate rainforest. The lake's 30 miles long. There's 239 miles of shoreline. It's situated on the North Shore of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and we love it. When we bought this home, we bought it sight unseen. We knew what the outside looked like, but the inside we didn't know. And I thought to myself, we'll just go in and throw some paint on the walls. We're gonna move in, it's done. When we got the keys and opened the door, mm -mm -mm. it only opened about five inches because of all the junk inside of it. It was a complete renovation in the fullest sense. We took it down to these studs. The only thing left standing was the roof. It was basically a shack. It took us around three months every weekend working on this house from sunrise to sundown to move in. We bought this place at a very, very affordable price because it had no amenities to offer. We did all the work ourselves and that saved a lot of money as well. We've lived in this floating home for right at two years now. We definitely have all four seasons here in Western North Carolina. The winters are chilly, especially up here at elevation in the mountains. And then the summers are really hot and that's both the air temperature and the water temperature. So life is a lot different depending on what season of the year it is that is kind of even more intensified when you're living on a boat. The water temperature is affecting the house and the lifestyle and the hobbies that we're doing change a lot. Our mooring fees cost us $2,500 a year. $208 a month for a rent if you break it down on a month to month basis. Not yeah. bad. Not bad. I work for the National Park Service seasonally as a forestry technician, so I've got about an hour drive to my duty station, not including the boat ride. I happen to work here and manage Fontana Marina. After a long day at work, I take the traffic jam ride home, quarter mile from the marina to the house, and I pull in here and dock the boat, tie it up, and get ready to start my evening. Sometimes when I come home from work, if it's summertime, we're sitting here and we're eating dinner. But the two chairs over here at the fireplace we use during the winter more because we'll actually light us a fire and sit out on the dock at night, watch the Milky Way or whatever stars we're seeing and enjoy our outdoor venue. Main thing is on these boat houses is you're living outside most of your time. So the main questions we get a lot about having a big breed dog on a houseboat is, is this dog getting enough exercise? Uh, Kita breeds are actually great for small environments. They do good in tiny homes, apartments. They don't require a lot of exercise. They actually sleep about 20 hours a day. We take her in the woods and run her a lot. She'll run two or three miles in the woods and then she's done. She comes home and she sleeps. Where, Where does, does the, the dog, dog poop? poop? That is what everybody wants to know. It is so funny of all the things you could be curious about with this kind of unique lifestyle. Everybody wants to know where Iko uses the bathroom. 
So we boat her over to the shore. She's very trustworthy. We can just let her off without a leash and she's able to, you know, run around and do her business in the woods and come back. That's what she prefers. It's always a good excuse to just hop in a boat and spend some time on the water anyways. Every boat's got to be named and we did a little reclaiming of some stuff from inside and got this PVC surf shack emblem made. This is actually leftover from our countertops. We decided let's use this outside to be a backdrop for our surf shack sign. As we transition to the starboard side of the house here, the boat house, everybody wants to know how do you anchor your boat out here. This is like it's 450 feet deep. We're in 150 feet of water here. So the anchoring system in this harbor is 10,000 pound concrete blocks hooked to this stainless cable. It's a 5 8 cable, 33,000 pound breaking strength, somewhere around that. And that block is taken out there and dropped and then hooked into this winch. And as the lake comes up and down, we adjust these winches to keep the boat from the bank. So in the summertime, our boat's back over in here as the water's up. In the wintertime, we pull ourselves out further. So the lake levels vary here, 65 feet-ish in the winter. They go start going down Labor Day, and they'll be all the way back up by Memorial Day. We're almost halfway down right now. We're around 50 feet below full pool. And so as the lake comes down, we have to slide the boat out from the banks because the banks come out with it. And as the lake comes back up, we'll slide the boat backwards towards the banks and keep the same depth under the boat at all times. Pretty simple idea though. Ropes go to the banks, they're hooked to trees, we use fire rope around the trees, and then that way we don't actually hurt the environment and you just keep track of it. You watch the lake levels and you make sure you have your boat adjusted properly. The house runs off of propane to cook and hot water. This is about a three month supply for us. So three months on a hundred pound bottle. I put this on a boat, take it to town, bring it back, unload it. The truck backs right up to the height of a boat, roll it on the truck, roll it back off the truck. You don't pick it up that much, but is it tough? Yeah, it's tough. So our hot water system is an outdoor hot water heater. It's on demand. We live off of solar, so we don't have a power bill. We do have internet. It runs off of Starlink and it works very efficiently. So all the solar systems and all hide in this box. I run a 2000 watt inverter. I run a six volt battery system that I step up to 12 volts. So I've got four six volt batteries that actually turn into two 12 volt batteries. Sarah's dinghy, this is the first boat she's ever owned. So we got her this one that comes with its own fenders built around it. She can run it into anything and it won't hurt the boat. And it's also Sarah's favorite toy now. All right, y'all, welcome to the interior of our floating tiny home build. We are working with 225 square feet, which even for tiny homes is on the tiny side of things. When we first came into this place, I cannot express to you how small that 225 square feet felt. We have done our very best to really open it up in every way possible and try and make it, you know, the most spacious, but yet cozy and warm feeling place that we can. We did change the layout a lot to make that happen, but I think it's worth noting that with these floating homes, there's a lot of restrictions on the way that you're able to rebuild them, so we weren't able to do things like put in a loft. So this place was, safe to say, it was in disrepair when we bought it. There were no basic amenities, and, and beyond that, it was an absolute mess. Pretty much the only thing that we salvaged from the entire build was this fridge, this stove, in part, we had to fix it up a lot, and parts of the cabinets here. We replaced the countertops, painted them, put new fixtures on them, but the actual wood was from the original counters here. So we tried to use what we could, but honestly, most of it was just truly not salvageable. There is actually very little storage in this house, and that is actually by design. Kind of by necessity, we forced ourselves to truly downsize and really purge a lot of our stuff. That was such a freeing process. 
We kind of chose open shelving throughout the whole house in an effort to help create that more open, spacious vibe. So we've got kind of an open design here leading into the living space as well, but this is basically our little kitchen nook. We don't have a lot of counter space to work with, but what we do have, we wanted to maximize by, for instance, using this uh, sink that had kind of a laid-in cutting board that could add a little extra space in there. So we get our drinking water from the lake. We have about a 30-foot hose that goes down deep into the water and pulls out lake water. We put that into a Berkey filter and filter it for drinking. The idea is when you pull water from the top of a lake, it's got sunshine hitting it, grows more bacteria, germs, stuff like that. The water 30 feet down is a lot colder, it carries less bacteria and germs, and that's the water that we use to drink. Our other water that provides sink, shower, toilet, it all comes from a line that we have run and every boat in this harbor has city water that's ran to it, which is a very nice feature on a boat because water is one of the main problems trying to get on a boat. Our fridge runs on either propane or solar. We typically run it on the propane just to reduce the draw on our solar and make sure that our batteries are always fully charged just in case. And then our little weather station we call this our tv because this is the closest thing we have to a tv here <laughs> but the weather is really important whenever you're on a boat just knowing you know how the winds are changing and how that might influence the way that we need to adjust our lines and things like that is very important to us so we keep really good track of our weather so brandon plays the banjo he's excellent at it he's got two banjos here I think the banjo is just a beautiful instrument as well, so we like kind of featuring that as a decorative item as well as just, you know, an effective way to store it and keep it from knocking around and falling on things when the boat is moving a lot. I don't think either one of us has ever experienced being like seasick on here. It's really not that level of intensity of movement because we don't have like a v-hole that's rocking we're kind of on a flat platform that's sort of sifting around side to side with the wind and on occasion doing this number but we're never really like a, a sailboat would just you know healing back and forth so it's not so bad so over here we've got our wood burning stove this is actually kind of a new addition to the house we've just got this this winter last winter we used propane to heat the house and come to find out, propane creates a ton of moisture, especially in a tiny space like this. So we wound up having a huge issue with condensation just running down all of our windows. We wound up going with a wood stove this year and it's already been just a huge improvement for us. The wood stove is our sole form of heat for the house. This particular tiny wood stove is created to heat up to 400 square feet. We are well within that and I will say that it absolutely runs us out of this place sometimes. It's very effective. We haven't had any issues staying warm so far. We typically use kind of a mixture of cut lumber and driftwood that we collect. The driftwood burns super, super hot so we really can't use solely driftwood until it's super duper cold. Otherwise, we will absolutely have to be opening all of the windows and doors. But we're saving a lot of money because propane is expensive and filling up our tank is very difficult logistically on the boat. Another unique feature of this house that kind of sets it apart from other tiny homes is that we happen to have the world's most massive couch in this really tiny space. This is something that we carried over from our last house and there was plenty of room for it there. We were really not even sure that it would fit through the door here. Coziness is a priority for us, and although we could have saved a couple feet on either side if we had, for instance, like a futon or something like that, a futon could never match the coziness of this really broken in leather couch that's like four feet deep. And it also conveniently is, you know, the size of a twin bed, so it, it's a great, you know, crash pad for guests if we have them on occasion. So another interesting facet of this house that I think is worth noting is that Everything that we put in here, we had to design with weight distribution very specifically in mind because obviously we're floating and there are floats distributed at certain points underneath the house. And if you put something really heavy and you know all on one side of the house, 
the house truly will be tilted. That's something that we have to be really conscious of in the way that we laid everything out was kind of designing it to make sure that the weight was very evenly distributed so that we could actually have a flat surface. And you have to also keep in mind we couldn't use a level for any of this because we're always moving. So everything had to be like eyeballed, which was really difficult in the building process, but it was kind of a fun challenge that just felt like it really fit the vibe of the mission anyways. So this was a really fun little DIY project that we did last summer. All of these hooks are actually cleats, dock cleats that you would use to tie up a boat with. These are just old cleats that we had laying around. We spray painted them and we thought that it made a really cute coat hanger. Unfortunately, you usually can't see them with the coats, but it's still just another really fun nautical touch that we added to the house. All right, so y'all come with me. We'll head back to the bedroom. So we are in the bed nook, as we call it. This is kind of directly behind the back wall of the kitchen. We kind of chose intentionally not to sacrifice a foot on either side for walking space around the bed. We thought a lot about it and we kind of played around with tape on the floor and seeing how that all might work. And at the end of the day, we just knew this is mainly like a sleeping area. This is really not like a where we're spending most of our time area. This is kind of a functional area. And the living room in there is where most of the living is gonna happen as far as when we're even inside at all. Back behind the bed, we do have a small shelf just to, you know, rest our phones and some books and coffee, things like that on. So we built in storage underneath the bed and all of our clothes, every single thing that we own to wear besides a few jackets that hang up on hooks are in one of these two drawers. I have one for myself and Brandon has one down here. Obviously, we we're kind of trying to incorporate a, a nautical vibe, particularly into this space, but really into the whole house, kind of nautical cozy is what we're going for. And so we've got the hanging kind of plant lanterns on rope, our rope on our drawers down here. And so just little bits and pieces here and there that make this place feel like what it is, which is a floating home. Moving on towards the back of the house from the bedroom, we have the bathroom here along the back wall of the house. Given that we're living here full time, a washer dryer was a must for us. A lot of the houseboats, folks that kind of come in on weekends or in the summers don't have that, but that definitely had to be a priority for us, especially with my job, you know, running around in the woods all the time and Brandon always getting oil and water on his clothes from his job. We really needed a place to wash our clothes. so. This is an all-in-one washer dryer. It is the only thing in the house that the solar cannot support. So it does have a significant draw that requires the use of a generator. So anytime we do laundry, which is, you know, once, twice a week's tops, we'll crank up the generator and it's a good opportunity to charge our batteries anyways if they need it. Something that we really like about this one is that it seems to be very efficient as far as water usage goes. All of our water gets funneled into a holding tank, which gets pumped out on a weekly basis. Every gallon of water kind of counts. The downside to this all-in-one is that we do not have a vent for it. We use it as a steam dryer, which creates very wrinkly clothes, in addition to the fact that we don't have a closet. So kind of all of our friends and coworkers just know every day we're gonna have wrinkly clothes. <laughs> And that's, that's just one of those things that we've learned to live with and kind of almost think of as you would think of wrinkles on the skin. It's just, it's natural and it happens and it's nothing to be um, embarrassed about. So, all right, so if we head this way, we can check out the rest of the bathroom. Originally, it was pretty clear that this space had been added on to an original structure before that. There was actually vinyl siding here. We wound up taking down this wall and scooching it back three inches to accommodate for our shower. We really wanted to have a spacious shower that didn't feel closed in and small. We really wanted a tub originally, but with the space that we were working with, if we wanted the laundry machine as well, it just wasn't gonna be feasible. So we thought, you know, at, at the very least, we could have a really big shower. So this one is at least three feet in width. It's, you know, a lot of space to do anything that you want. <laughs> This is, I will say, the one space on the whole house where if we start rocking a lot with the wake of somebody's boat, this is the one space sometimes I can feel like a little bit weird in and I don't know why that is, but maybe it's because there's also water running and for some reason that confuses my mind. 
So our toilet is a macerating marine toilet. We use marine toilet paper, so it's not a problem. It can go directly into the toilet. Brandon actually wrote a grant together with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation. With this new grant that he wrote, it is now only $5 for an entire pump out. So five bucks a week handles our septic. You pretty much operate it like a normal toilet with the only exception being that it has a water saving handle. Again, so we don't fill up our tank too quickly. So instead of automatically just filling the whole bowl with water, you can choose how much water goes into it instead of you know just wasting a whole gallon when that's not really necessary. I can't really think of many bathrooms that have such a spectacular view. It's just water and forest, so it just kind of adds to that overall like no matter where you are no matter what you're doing in the house you always kind of have that reminder that you're somewhere that's incredibly peaceful and wonderful living on the water you're just at constant ease it just seems to soothe your soul it's really something special and, and i think we've noticed it in our relationship, we argue a lot less ever since moving out here, which is kind of interesting. And, you know, I wear like a Fitbit and it's been funny to see like my resting heart rate has dropped since living out here. Just all kinds of different ways we've noticed that our life has improved. After living on the water, it would be very difficult for me to go back to life on land. I just feel very spoiled. <laughs> This can look a lot different depending on where you are, but it's pretty cool just to know that it's actually possible, accessible, affordable to live life on the water 24 seven and be comfortable while you do it. Thanks for watching this week's video. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you soon with another tiny or unique home tour.